Hey everyone, today I have a Frigidaire Affinity dryer in my shop. It has a pedestal on it, but you can fix yours regardless if it has the pedestal or not. Today we're dealing with the subject of a unit not heating right. I want to show you how to take it apart and look at all the different components in this to see what went bad and what needs replaced. Sometimes you could get error codes on it, such as an E64 error code, which typically is the element but I wanna show you all the different possibilities that could cause this unit not to work. I will have some of the replacement items in the description as well as links in the comment field. So if you need to place anything, you can you know, support the channel by buying it through the links. So let's go ahead and get the unit tested and tore down to figure out what's going on. You just need mainly a screwdriver and a multimeter to figure and test everything out. Uh, I'll have links for those too. So let's get to it. For tools, to test and fix a no heat issue on this dryer, you're going to need a Phillips head screwdriver to take the entire unit apart. I would suggest a drill gun to make the job faster in general though, because there's a lot of screws on this. Also to test the various components, we need a multimeter as well. And I will have a link to this exact one in the description as well as a cheaper model. Also, if your unit gets warm, but it doesn't dry clothes, you're probably gonna need a vacuum cleaner and or flexible attachment to get into the hard to reach areas to remove lint that is probably the problem. Before we take this unit apart though, let's just make sure that the unit's actually being powered properly. Behind the dryer, there is a metal cover with one Phillips head screw on it that needs removed to access the terminal block to the unit. When you have the cover off, inspect the terminal block. Does any area of the cord or block itself look blackened, damaged, or burnt up? If so, this would cause the unit not to get sufficient power to heat properly. One wire could be sending a current to the motor and the interface, but the other line going to heat would not be there causing the issue. Now to test and confirm that you are getting voltage to the terminal block though, if it looks okay, use a multimeter and set it to voltage AC. Use the two leads and press them on the block. Center to left should get 120 volts. Center to right should get 120 volts as well. Then left to right should get between about 208 and 240 volts AC. If your unit gets much less than 208 volts or one side gets under 120 volts, electric's going to be your issue and not the unit itself. This could be an issue with the power cord, outlet, or simply that the breaker needs cycled all the way off, then all the way on. You can also use a multimeter to test the outlet, and if you find lower voltages on it, then you need to replace the outlet, breaker, or you may have a different electrical problem that this video will not cover. Again, you would get 120 to the center, the left side, then the right side, then 240 volts in the middle. Let's go ahead and get back to the machine to check a few more things. To get into the machine, remove the two screws on the rear of the dryer top and then slide the top back and then away from the unit. You may find a hidden tech manual here that can offer some help on the unit later on. We will use this much later in the video. At this stage, go ahead and unplug electricity from the wall. There are two screws that hold this interface into the bulkhead of the unit, and you'll need to remove them to get to the technician sheet, among other things. There's also a wire holding the interface on that we need to remove. You can remove two screws from the metal bracket that kind of holds this harness in place. You can remove these screws to get an easier chance at removing the wire, but it's not actually needed you may be able to just put a screwdriver in and pull it out. I would take a picture of any wires we remove from any sort of control board. Frigidaire has a bad habit of these harnesses fitting in the wrong plugs. With the interface wire removed, you can change into an entirely different shirt and remove the interface. Next, I'm going to remove these two screws that hold the dryer control board in place. This allows me to remove it from the bulkhead. Then you wanna open the door of the dryer and locate the two screws that hold the front of the dryer onto the gray bulkhead behind the front. In the case of this unit, there are two screws that hold the lint filter housing in that need removed. These screws are very different from the others, but they're still Phillips head. Once you have them removed, close the door. Then at the bottom of the dryer, there are going to be two screws that need removed. One on each side that's not exactly on the corner of each, it's a little bit on the inside. This dryer is on a pedestal, so the angles are a bit odd to remove them. If your unit is not stacked like this, you can easily lean it against a wall for much easier access, but I cannot do it on this unit. There are two more final screws to remove at the very top of the dryer front, one on the left, one on the right. Once you have these two out, the door may want to move forward and away from the unit, so be ready to catch it potentially. From here, carefully lift the door up and away from the dryer. Only remove it partially though, as you need to remove the door switch wire in between the door and the bulkhead of the unit. With the front off, you can investigate any irregularities with the unit. 
we need to first remove the switch from the control board that plugs into the door light. Make sure to photograph this or note its location, as again, it could vary from board to board. Go ahead and use your screwdriver to remove the two lower screws on the bulkhead. Once off, lift the bulkhead up and gently move it away. Note that in the lower right corner, the door switch wire harness will be held on with a cable tie. You can use a pair of needle nose pliers to pinch the tie and remove it from the bulkhead without cutting it. And then you can finally remove the bulkhead from the unit, or you could just place it to the side without taking this off. When you have this done, we can look further into the unit for any trouble areas. The next step we have to deal with is to take the drum out. Just remember that there are sharp metal corners on your dryer, so when you reach in, you would want to wear gloves and possibly a long sleeve shirt. This dryer had some dangerous thrash metal in it, but you are far more likely to find sharp, dangerous metal that would actually cut you instead, so watch out. Next, reach in with both hands and locate the idler pulley on the right side behind the blower and motor assembly. The idler will need pulled off to your left to loosen tension on the belt, then move the belt away from the motor pulley. This will let you take the drum out. With the belt away from the pulley, use the belt to lift the drum up and out of the dryer. Some versions of these Electrolux Frigidaire dryers could have cuts in the middle of the bulkhead to make it easier to take the drum out from the chassis, but others do not. From here, we have an inside view of the drum and its heating components. They're all pretty much located at the bottom of the unit, and the two key areas to look at are the heating canister and the blower housing. But before we test some components, one thing you want to look at is the filter housing. It would be hugely beneficial to look at it and see if there's any lint. At first, I use a flexible vent hose to clean the inside of the unit, but as I go on, it continually gets clogged telling me there's something majorly wrong inside the vent. I do have a link to the lint cleaning kit on our website if you need something like this, by the way, but eventually it got so much, I just reach up and grab a huge ball of nasty lint, which is terrible for this used machine and would cause it not to dry your clothes, but would still allow the unit to heat. For a reference, you could have just removed the screws on the filter trap without removing the bulkhead or drum to solve the issue, but at least this way you kind of see the process of everything that we do. Now let's test some components. First up is the black blower thermistor. This checks to ensure that the heat out of the vent is at a good temperature, and if it is bad, it may overheat and pop the other fuses or just not heat up at all. First take off the terminals, then use a multimeter. On this particular one, set it to ohms resistance, and if it's not auto-ranging, you need to put it into the 20 to 200K area. The proper result for this type of black thermistor is between 50 and 55,000 ohms, or 50 and 55K ohms at room temperature. If yours is much outside this range, or you get an OL symbol, then it's likely that this item is defective and needs replaced. Also note that there are a lot of thermistors similar to this on the market, from Samsung and Whirlpool, but with much lower values, those different ones that are cheaper will not work. Make sure that you use the right Frigidaire thermistor for your unit, and I'll have a link to the correct replacement for these kinds of models in the video, but always reference your dryer model number. Then go ahead and put the terminals back and do a similar test on the outlet fuse of the vent pipe. Remove the wires, set your multimeter to ohms resistance, then put your leads on the terminals. But this fuse should show you 0.00, .00 or pretty close to it if it's in work, good working order. If you get an OL symbol, it's bad and needs replaced. Let's go to the heating element canister. There are three components to the heating element canister. The thermostat at the rear, the fuse in the middle, and then the element terminals at the front. And yours could look different from this. Let's start at the back though and work our way forward. The very rear unit is the thermostat. And the test is simply unplug your wires, set your multimeter to ohms or continuity, and see what the result is. You should get 0.00, .00 or very close to it if it's good. If you get an OL symbol, then it's bad and this needs replaced. Next up is the thermal fuse, and we're going to do an identical test on it. Remove the wires, ohms resistance or continuity, and then test the fuse and see what you get. This one should also get 0.00, .00 ohms or very close to it. If you get an OL symbol here on this, it's bad causing the unit not to heat and needs replaced to solve the heating issue. But as a note, if this fuse pops, it generally means your dryer got overheated causing this fuse to trip, preventing the dryer from burning up. Make sure to clean your dryer and lint system as well as replace this fuse. I would suggest replacing the thermostat as well because sometimes that can fail in a way that it constantly feeds heat and would show good on a multimeter. So again, replace both of these at the same time if that fuse is bad. Now let's get to the element itself. You need to remove all the connectors to the heat canister. Some of these units are going to have two wires on the left and others are going to have three on the left and one on the right like the one we have here. 
Testing them though is similar. You want to set your multimeter to ohms resistance, then test each of the connections. The right side is from the motor and the left ones are from the sensors and heat system. You should get between 25 and 30 ohms of resistance between the right post and any of the three on the left. If you find that any of these connections show an OL symbol, the coil is bad and needs replaced. You can also test between the post on the left side individually and you'd get 50 ohms of resistance. For reference, I do have a two wire system here. You simply need to check the posts of the unit to, with the same ohm test, but here you should get roughly 10 ohms of resistance. If you get an OL symbol, the unit is bad and needs replaced. Another test you can do is press or attach a lead to the metal canister housing itself. Then move the other lead from your multimeter to each post individually. If you get any sort of number on this when you do ohms resistance or it beeps in continuity, a wire from the canister is pressing against the metal can that you can't see grounding it out. This could cause all sorts of issues and if you get anything other than OL, the canister absolutely needs replaced. If you find that you do need to remove the canister, you want to remove all the wires from the sensors and then the heating element noting their collars and orientation so you don't get confused on any of the same colored wires when you put them back on. There are two screws that hold the feet of the canister in place. From here, you may be able to re remove the canister if it's been worked on before. However, on many of these units, there's going to be a small screw at the rear right side of the bulkhead that holds the canister in place. You will need an angled wrench or very short stubby Phillips head screwdriver to remove this. If you do need to replace an element, check the links in the video as we sell a high quality third party version from ERP. Let's go ahead and remove the legs and sensors from the old canister. Each sensor has two small screws on them. And once you have those screws out, there are two screws on the inside of the lip of the element. You may need to bend the front of the face plate slightly and then remove these two screws to remove the front cover of the element. With the correct element now in hand, we can reassemble the heating element canister. Set the thermal fuse in place and screw in the proper small screws and they're identical for both of these items. If either of these need to be replaced, you could have replaced them potentially in the dryer chassis, but this is at least easier to show on screen. Then set the legs of the canister into place on the element. The legs of the element will seat into a small recess on the element to line everything up. Then go ahead and reinstall the two screws going from the element into the feet. If you bent the metal cover out to make it easier to install, make sure you press that back in a little bit closer to the element canister. Now you can install the element canister into place. It will seat only one way and the feet will have small metal slots that fit into the bottom of the dryer chassis so that it orients itself correctly. Make sure the element is seated into the rear of the bulkhead as the entire system should be quite snug. Once the element's in place, reattach the two screws on the feet, and if you're feeling lucky, the screw in the back. Now, if you replace it with an aftermarket element like I did here that was way cheaper than OEM, the terminal spade connector doesn't quite fit the wire exactly, so we have to modify it just a little bit on the right side, but we'll go and plug in all the connections first. To stretch the wire, I'm simply clipping the wire harness that the wire was connected to and then running it easier with more slack to the element. You wanna make sure not to bend this spade connector, putting it into the element at all, because you do not want to force and bend that spade connector as it would degrade when it runs much faster than normal. Once you have it fit in securely, I will reattach the wire trunk with a high temperature cable tie. Something else that I mentioned at the start of this video, if you need more room to access the terminal block, you can remove this entire back panel for more room, I'll be showing you how to do that in depth in a video where I replace the roller wheels. It's a lot of screws and we'll save that for the next video. Make sure to check the description for that one though. These are all the major things on the inside of the unit that would regard heat and generally these are the most likely fixes. But there is one or two very advanced things I want to show you, but we need to reassemble the dryer first. So let's go ahead and do that. First, make sure that the idler pulley didn't have the spring or any other components accidentally pop off. The spring popped off on this one and I need to reattach it. Make sure that the belt is oriented right as well around the drum. Make sure that the belt is installed on the ridge where you see wear a wear pattern on the drum. This also shows you which side of the drum needs inserted first as the rear ridge will orient where the idler pulley and motor are. Be careful to slowly insert the drum back into the unit. The drum will rest on the rear bulkhead in between the roller wheels so it should be somewhat snug and secure. When you have the drum installed, Reach your hands into where the idler pulley is and pull the pulley towards you to the left or the camera's right, and then loop the belt around the motor pulley. The plastic pulley has a huge groove in it so it only orients one way and is very secure once you get it in the right way. Make sure the ridges of the belt are lined facing on the inside of the drum so it catches the teeth on the motor pulley as well. When the drum is installed, 
you can rotate it and it should spin the blower housing wheel to make sure the system's installed properly and there's no noise coming from anything where within the blower, belt, or idler system. We want to go ahead and put the bulkhead back on and there are four holes for tabs on the side of the bulkhead to rest on. To install the bulkhead, bring it to the chassis and slowly line it up into place. On this model, the tabs on the top will slot into place, allowing you to line up the screws with the chassis. It may take some time to line these two up once it fits into place. It will slot in. You may have to rotate the drum to get it to slide in smooth for it to line up on the rollers that were on the front of the bulkhead that you can't see as it's behind the bulkhead in front of the drum. It can take a few moments to get this right, but at least for me on this particular unit, it wasn't hard. Then you want to reinstall two bottom screws into the bulkhead. Go ahead and snap the door switch wire harness back into the bulkhead like you see here and then go ahead and reinstall the door light switch into the main control board. On mine, it only had one area to install, but yours could be different and again, refer to any pictures that you've taken. If you haven't yet, install the two screws onto the control board cross plate once the fingers are inserted of the bulkhead like you see here. Finally, at this stage, we can put the door back into place. When putting the front of this dryer back on, don't forget at this stage to reinstall the door wire harness into the front of the unit before you secure it to the bulkhead. Like the bulkhead, it has tabs to rest on the dryer chassis that need lined up. There are four of them, and this is a slow process, but at least it wasn't too difficult for me to do. Once you have it lined up and secured, install the two screws at the top of the door between the door front and the bulkhead into the chassis, one on the left side and one on the right side. Go ahead and open the door and reinstall the two large screws that were at the bottom of the filter housing. Go ahead then and reinstall the wire that goes from the interface to the control board. Make sure to reinsert the wire to the correct receptacle on the board. And again, I removed the metal bracket so you could see how this was installed. You don't have to do this if you didn't remove it in the first place. Two small tabs on the interface will lock into the front of the dryer, securing it into place with all the wires back into place. And you could test the dryer at this point. Everything's more or less reassembled. But let's say you've done all this and the dryer doesn't heat. Well, what could it be? There's one final possibility that the control board is not sending power to the element and this is a kind of advanced thing to look at. First, take pictures again of all the wires on the control board to make sure you remove and reinstall them to the right places. Once you have that done, remove the two screws from the crossbar that holds it into place. One on the top left side, and one may be hidden under the wires. You may have to remove the wire to make it easier to access the screw behind the wire trunk. Again, keep the unit unplugged at this point. With the screws out, you can lift the board up and easily remove the rest of the wires from the control system this particular unit had eight sets of wires. With the control board removed, you can pry the tabs that hold the top cover on. There are about five or six tabs on this unit. With the top cover removed, you can pull the board out and inspect it for damage. You can see on this unit, there's a very clear relay that has some burnt damage on it. You should also look on the underside for burnt traces or a connection that may have lost its solder. If you see extensive damage, you may need to replace the board. Although even with a little bit of blackened damage to the clear relay, it still worked. Despite the damage, the board is okay in our situation. So there's one more difficult test you can do. This isn't for DIYers, but you're still watching the video, so I wanna show you how to do this. I'm going to reference the picture and reinstall all the wire harnesses on the board, all eight connections to it, but I'm not screwing the board back into place. From here, I'm going to reference that schematic we pulled out near the very beginning of the video and find the pinout from the wires on the control board to the heating element. I'm going to plug the unit back into place and use extreme caution to test the board for voltage. As the unit turns on and runs, I can test the outputs from the board to see if it's sending a signal to keep the heating element running. There may be multiple outputs to test this, but the way I did it was to put one lead on the terminal block at the rear of the unit where the black wire was going into the motor system, and then one lead on each of the wires going from the board to the heating element seeing if I get 240 volts of electricity. If you read the schematic and do this properly, the right connections are J52, J71, and J73. You can test the black wire on the terminal to each of these pinouts and see if you get proper voltage telling you if the board's actually sending the right signal. If it is working properly, you'll get something over 200 volts. But if it is not working properly, you get under 200 volts and then clearly the board's relays are bad and you need to replace it. This is not a DIY thing, but I wanted to test my schematic reading skills to see if I could do this for fun. These are all the major things I wanna show you how to test 
for no heat going into your Frigidaire Electrolux front load stackable unit. I hope that an idea here helped you. And again, if you found a part that needed replaced, please consider purchasing from the links in the description. I will have another video or two soon on this style dryer. Have a great day.